this week on the Back Table Podcast. We were faced with this blank canvas, right? A whole lot of uncertainty because, you know, there was a period of time where you were afraid to get anywhere near a COVID patient. You thought it was like Ebola or something where you were immediately going to get it and there was going to be a 90% fatality rate. And it was like a zombie apocalypse movie. None of us knew what we were dealing with. So we had this blank canvas and we painted it and then we realized half of it was wrong. So we tore it up and started another canvas and we've kind of continually repainted it. And I'd love to hear if everybody else's experiences have been similar in that way and that we're all just trying to figure out what the right thing was to do. And it's taken us nine months, but we're really honing down and refining our best practices along the way. And those that's how we improve patient quality and quality care in the otolaryology world in this, in this uh, sort of unprecedented time. Welcome back to the Back Table ENT Podcast. I'm your host, Gopi Shaw, and we have a very special podcast today on quality and safety in pediatric ENT. My co-host today is Dr. Romaine Johnson, Associate Professor and Director of Pediatric Airway Program at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. You may remember Romaine from Episode 5, Pediatric Tracheostomy, The Long Game. Welcome back to the show, Romaine. How are you doing today? Doing great. Doing Thanks good. for having me. I'm excited for this discussion on pediatric quality and safety, and we have an all-star panel today. We have Dr. Shaham Roy, Dr. Jennifer Lavin, and Dr. Jonathan Ida. Shaham Roy is a tenured professor and vice chairman of otolaryngology at the University of Texas in Houston. He's the chair-elect for the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Committee for the AAO for 2021 to 2023. Dr. Roy is the international surgical expert in operating room fires and safety and is an integral physician leader with both the FDA and Joint Commission Committees on Prevention of Surgical Fires. You doing all right, Shaham? Yeah, good morning. Thanks for having me. I've got a face that's made for radio, so this is perfect. For me. <laughs> I thought you were going to say a voice, because if anybody's heard Dr. Shom Roy speak uh, live, it's it's the most engaging talks or lectures uh, that you'll have. Um, next, we have Dr. Jennifer Lavin. She's an assistant professor of pediatric otolaryngology at Northwestern University Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. She holds a Master's of Science in Healthcare Quality and Patient Safety from Northwestern, and she serves as the Director of Quality and Safety for the Division of Pediatric Otolaryngology. She's a member of the Button Battery Task Force, Nisquip P ENT Task Group, the ASPO Quality and Safety Committee, and the AAO Infectious Disease Committee. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And then we finally, we have Dr. Jonathan Ida. He's an assistant professor in pediatric otolaryngology at Northwestern University at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. He's the medical director for the Aerodigestive Program and serves as a vice chair for procedural services, supporting and leading numerous process quality and safety initiatives for the Department of Surgery. He has authored several papers on quality improvement and process improvement in otolaryngology and surgical services. He's also participated in several consensus recommendations, including the International Pediatric Otolaryngology Group, consensus recommendations on the prenatal and perinatal management of anticipated airway obstruction, competency-based assessment tool for pediatric esophagoscopy, and competency-based assessment tool for pediatric tracheostomy, and outcome measures for pediatric laryngotracheal reconstruction international consensus statement. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Thanks, Kobe. That it's was nice a to lot. See that, you. Was a, that was that was a lot of words. Uh, it's a mouthful. I haven't seen you since uh, Tulane. I was a medical student, and I think you were a PGY three. That's right. So it's nice to see you. All right. So I hope everybody's doing well. I'm going to go ahead and turn over the mic to you, Romaine, and let you lead the way. Thank you so much, all three of you coming. I'm going to start with Dr. Roy. You know, Dr. Roy and I. I feel like we look like we could be brothers. I always joke with him about that. And um, obviously, you are a leader in the field of pediatric laryngology quality and safety, I would hope that you could talk for a few minutes about uh, what it takes to actually bring about transformational change in, in terms of leadership and, and getting people to buy into quality and safety efforts, and as well as just tell us a little bit about your own uh, personal story. All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Romain, you hit it on the head when you asked kind of the, the critical question, what does it take to get buy-in? And how do you end up getting there? And the interesting thing is, and I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts on this, but otolaryngologists as a whole are far more attentive to quality and safety metrics and to the concept of quality and safety for patient care than many other medical specialties. And I feel like in a lot of ways, as otolaryngologists, we've been way ahead of the curve. So we're fortunate to be starting from a very good place. And a second big part of that, which I think has to do with kind of the caliber of people that are on this podcast right now, 
is that the folks who are doing this are the people who are really attentive to these kinds of issues. Pediatric otolaryngologists in general are, are really attuned to the concepts of quality when it comes to taking care of kids and taking care of sick children. And of course, safety is our, our fundamental and priority. It's our highest priority is to make sure that we are taking safe care of children because parents have entrusted us with the care of their most valuable, their most valuable thing in their world, which is their children. And so we're all kind of attuned to that to begin with. Getting buy-in is always a little bit of a challenge, but I think that all of us kind of pull together. When you have partners, we all kind of work together towards a common good, and that common good is good outcomes for our patients, be they uh, children, adults, whatever, in otolaryngology. We're really paying attention to trying to do the right thing for our patients, and so it's a lot easier to get buy-in, I think, in our field than maybe it is in some others. Uh, my personal journey actually stems from one that is slightly less romantic. I mean, I think a lot of people will tell you that their quality and safety journey started because they took a strong interest in quality as a resident or as a fellow and started doing some work in quality. I was kind of the, the second half of that story, which was about 15 years ago when I was just out into practice. I had a near miss bad experience. And that near miss bad experience really spooked me. And so I said, okay, I'm going to dive into the scientific literature to find out why this happened and what I can do to prevent this from ever happening again. And as I started delving further and further into understanding what the potential causes were of these kinds of near-miss experiences, I found that there was no good data, no good science behind surgical fires in the operating room. And so I said, well, if there's no good science on it, let's create the science. So we started doing the basic science studies. We started doing the mechanical modeling. We started doing the publishing and presenting and getting that data out there. And so we sort of found the science in our own world because it wasn't there beforehand. And that has since escalated into sort of a lifetime career focusing around quality and safety issues. So sometimes all it takes is just one bad moment to really scare you into, into finding your own transformation. I think my career was a little bit aimless up until that happened. So you know, one of the things I'm interested in, just personally speaking, is performance. So how do, you, how do you figure out what you do best? And then how do you translate that into action? And then figuring out how to lead people to, you know, to the promised land, so to speak. You've come a long way. You started off with a near miss, and now you are you know, one of the tops in the field. So clearly you were able to get people to buy into what you were saying, you figured out how you performed, how do you interact with people, and how do you get people to, you know, believe what you're saying, so to speak. Can you talk about those experiences a a a along your journey? Yeah, you know, you bring up an interesting point. Quality, when you look at quality metrics, and if your institution is involved, for example, with Vizient or with any of the big quality associations that's tracking quality markers for your institution, that data can be a little bit dry. And the quality reports you get, which are these detailed kind of fancy looking spreadsheets, they can be a little bit dry. And it's hard to go out and say, look at all this quality data and let's make this really interesting for you because it doesn't seem very interesting when you have these large pallets of data. But if you can turn it into a compelling story, if you can turn it into something that means something for people. And when I give my talks on safety in otolaryngology operating rooms, one of the first things that I show is a picture of a drape that almost burned a child, had a huge hole in the middle of the drape where a burn had occurred through the drape. And I show that picture and say, this drape was on top of a child. And then my next slide shows that the child had actually been moved onto the stretcher before that drape burned. But it's those kinds of personal compelling stories that I think capture people and make them realize like, whoa, wait a minute, this isn't just dry, raw data. This is stuff that happens on a ground level to each of us every single day, every operation that we do. Every time a parent entrusts us with their child for surgery, there are risks involved and every one of those cases has a risk involved. And so our job is to make sure that that risk is absolutely minimized. So I think that by turning it into a personal sort of uh, narrative, we can capture people's minds and we can engage them in these processes because, again, otolaryngologists are really attuned to these kinds of issues, I think. Dr. Lavin, you know, speaking of process improvement, you wrote a, a very excellent trilogical thesis on process improvement. And in fact, that, you know, I want to applaud you. I believe you won one of the top awards that year that your thesis was accepted. Can you talk about how you thought up of the idea of your, your thesis? What were the steps involved? What were the findings? And also, again, how did you try to implement those changes? What were the, the, the struggles and successes that you, you 
found as you went through that that whole process? Yeah, so I when I did my thesis, one of the things that I was tasked with doing was determining, you know, why do we have unanticipated ICU admissions to the PICU? And one of the things that we were looking at was looking into the data, you know, there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of what we call gray zone area of these intermediate risk patients who are either undergoing adenotonsillectomy or who are undergoing a endoscopic airway procedure with some sort of intervention. You know, there's literature that shows, you know, some patients are at a higher risk than others, but even a lot of those patients do just fine. And speaking to the people in the PICU, one of the, some of the feedback that we got was that, you know, you're sending these kids who are having tonsils up that are, quote, high risk, and they're chowing down on pancakes and they're wasting a bed. And so, you know, what we're trying to, what we were trying to do was trying to prevent these unanticipated ICU admissions while at the same time not over, over utilizing the ICU. And one of the really important things when you do quality, and I think that, you know, surgeons, we like to fix things and that's very advantageous. However, at the same time, we're also very used to making rapid decisions under pressure. And that can sometimes work against you in quality because sometimes you jump straight to the solution without fully understanding the problem. And so we actually took a step back and we looked at our data and we looked at all of these patients that we admitted to the PICU and whether or not they utilized resources and at what point their uh, resource utilization need became clear. And what we found was that the majority of patients, it is very clear within the first two hours um, after surgery that they need ICU or not ICU. And so what we did, and this is another really important principle of quality or a process improvement, quality improvement, is you have to sometimes challenge foundational assumptions. And so what we did was we challenged the assumption that you must make all decisions preoperatively regarding postoperative dis uh, disposition. And instead, what we did was we observed patients in the PACU for two hours and completed our decision making in the first two perioperative hours. And so in doing that, we were actually in one fiscal year able to save about approximately 240 admissions to the ICU, which amounted to about $1.1 million in uh, charge savings to the system. And so, you know, those are the kind of things that you kind of need to be thinking about um, as far as quality. As far as getting people on board and getting people engaged, um, you need to really do a, a very thorough stakeholder analysis. You have to engage. So we engage the PACU staff from the get-go. They help design the model. Um, so then it's not a top-down phenomenon. And then you have buy-in and agreement because they helped build it. Um, and I think that if you really build your stakeholder group well, you're going to get a lot further. How did you engage the, the business folks in the hospital? You know, one of the challenges that we face is the, you know, the hospital wants to know up front that they can guarantee that ICU admission if it's needed. Because if we put a kid, if we say we admit a kid who has a tonsillectomy to the PACU, and then we decide, oh, you really need to go to the ICU. If we didn't request that bid ahead of time, the hospital gets dinged for it. Did that, was that a challenge for you as well? We were in a somewhat advantageous situation where our ICU was at 80 plus percent capacity too regularly. And so we were actually having problems where approximately 40, I think, ICU transfer rejections had, had occurred the previous fiscal year. And so because of that, that was actually lost revenue. And, and, you know, one of the challenges that you have, especially when trying to improve quality, is sometimes improving quality helps in a value-based system but does not necessarily help for fee-for-service models. And it's advantageous when um, you have something that is beneficial in both. And so in our particular case, us freeing up those beds, we could then send them to the, we came to them and say, hey, look, you had 40 rejections in the past year. We can unload these unnecessary admissions that are reimbursing at an observation rate. So you can have a child come in from another institution at a full inpatient rate and free up the beds to be able to, to allow those children to stay there. What were some of the other processes that you, as you kind of went through your project, what are some of the other things that you discovered sort of tangentially say, oh, I didn't realize that we were doing this. This was, this is another area that we could potentially improve things. The, you know, the, some of the areas that were, you know, unexpected was we didn't realize, you know, at first we were thinking mainly just, you know, TNAs, 
things like that. But, you know, we also found that endoscopic airways, so like I said, supraglottoplasties, posterior laryngeal clefts, so we were able to expand the number of patients that we were able to do. We're currently looking at the hospital as, you know, can this go beyond otolaryngology? Can we possibly include some of our neuromuscular spine patients? You know, can we have, you know, even patients, one of the things that I found in my retrospective look prior to initiating this study was for whatever reason, children um, after tonsillectomy with gastrostomy tubes were more likely to need the ICU. And they're actually the most likely of all of our group to need the ICU. And I don't know if that's because they can't uh, handle their own secretions postoperatively, et cetera. But then we were like, well, maybe, you know, these patients who have poor secretion control in other settings, you know, some of those dental cases, et cetera, might also benefit from such a model to avoid unanticipated ICU emission. You know, that's interesting. We're looking at our ICU utilization as well, and we're looking at respiratory complications after tonsillectomy. And what we found is one of the strongest predictors is the child has a gastrostomy tube. And I think, you know, is it the gastrostomy tube per se, or is it the medical conditions associated with having a gastrostomy tube that puts them at a higher risk? But that, that's interesting that you, you saw something very similar. How did you... How did you decide that you wanted to do quality improvement? Obviously, you got a master's degree in these sciences. What what was your motivation? So when I was in fellowship, I went to uh, Children's National Medical Center in D.C., and I got to work with Rahul Shah, who is the quality and safety director there. Um, he is one of the otolaryngologists there. And so he helped mentor me through some projects. And I realized that it was something that I was interested in. So then when I uh, joined the team at Lurry, I expressed interest in pursuing this master's. And Dr. Dana Thompson was very supportive. It's funny, Jennifer, my, uh, his brother, Udayan Shah, was my mentor and attending when I was a resident who oh, cool. got me interested in pediatric ENT. So shout out to the Shaw brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, hey, Dr. Jennifer, on that, yeah. on that note, just real quick, you know, I'm actually submitting my trial thesis this year, and I would love for you to just take a quick eyeball of it, if you don't mind. It sounds like you've got really good oh, experience. I'd, I'd be happy to. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. <laughs> so, uh, Romain, before we move, can yeah. I can make a comment on that process as well? Absolutely. Um, one thing that's really interesting about that story is how one good question actually begat a much better question for the hospital because they were looking at us and saying, why are you having, you know, two or three unplanned ICU admissions a month? And then when we looked at it, and it's, it was more along the lines of like, why are we admitting these 25 kids to the ICU a month? And it was a much better question. And that was that burning platform that we could offer back to the hospital to say, look, you go through all this and we're going to keep 25 kids a month out of your ICU. That's an excellent point. D Dr. Ida, you, uh, you and I spoke, I guess, back in April and it, it was about COVID. Now we're obviously still in the middle of a pandemic and, you know, lots of people are, are uh, sick and a lot of hospital beds are being filled. And obviously, it, I, maybe a lot of the viewers know, but certainly people who, in, who are in laryngology know that COVID has had a huge impact on our specialty. And then you and I talked, we were talking about the, what they call aerosolized generating procedures and how can we adapt to those changes. Can you talk about that? I guess the whole story for the, as if someone never heard of the, the air AGPs and what that meant to otolaryngology and how you found yourself, you sort of charged with, okay, how do I figure this out? How do I make things safe for us as well as continue to take care of the patients? Yeah, that was a huge challenge. And I would assume that it was a, a huge challenge in a lot of places in that, again, every, every hospital is different. Every institution is different, but there are varying levels of influence that otolaryngology divisions can have depending on your institution, whether it's a pediatric only institution or whether you're part of a larger adult healthcare system that is then even more shunting resources over to adults. Within pediatrics, I would, I would have gone into it assuming that we would have been in a better position because we don't have that shunt. That was not necessarily our experience that we really had to kind of hitch our wagon to some other specialties that had a stronger national voice and a stronger voice within the institution, specifically anesthesiology, gastroenterology, neurosurgery, etc. And we really tried very hard in our institution to unify our voice. Looking back, it was it, it's, it's hard to say that it was necessarily the wrong thing of any administration to do. But in the moment, it was very hard to swallow the idea that sticking a scope in the nose is not considered an AGP, but intubating someone is. 
and that was somewhat validated later and that there were the highest volume of, of virus is in the nose and nasopharynx, right? So for example, even today, many hospitals have not admitted that nasal endoscopy and nasopharyngoscopy are aerosol generating. In many best case scenarios, the hospital just kind of turns its head and says, okay, do what you feel like you need to do, but we're going to do what we need to do. So through that all, we've really had to navigate it a lot of times sort of on a grassroots level, being very careful, deciding who we are going to do a aerosol generating, generating procedure on, who we are not going to, who we're going to defer it, whether we're going to defer all fees exams to sleep swallow studies, and, and you know, whether we're going to, you know, how we're going to manage our tracheostomies, how do we approach the institution about rapid testing, how do we approach institution about repeat testing when it comes to someone who's been in the hospital and needs a tracheostomy. So there's there's been so many questions, and it's been quite a political uh, maze to maneuver. And I'm sure that's been very similar throughout institutions across the country. I'm curious, maybe we should talk about COVID for a few minutes. You know, we have we have Dr. Roy, who's a part of the leadership team of the university and hospitals. And then we have someone like me, who's just kind of a scut monkey, you know, doing his best to take care of patients. How did, <laughs> I'm curious, Dr. Roy, how did you, and then we can come back to Dr. Ida and, and, and everyone else as well, but what happened, I just remember I came back from vacation in March and there was an email chain about if we do AGPs, we're all going to die. Everybody started freaking out. I'm sure you got that email as well. What was it like from the sort of bird's eye leadership view when, when that started, that information started to come out? Yeah, you know, first of all, I got to take some issue with you describing yourself as a scud monkey, Romain. You and I, <laughs> you and I kind of grew up together in this in this business, and you and I were contemporaries, and we went through training around the same time, and we've kind of been in this. We're the same together. age. We are, and we've watched each other kind of grow up in this career path. You are hardly what anyone would call themselves a scut monkey. But, you know, it is interesting because you asked me to look back to those first days of the pandemic. And folks, I got to be honest, I barely remember it. I, it just feels like a lifetime ago. Like, this is what we know now. I can't remember what it felt like to get on a plane. I can't remember what it felt like to see you guys in person. I know I miss it, but I don't, I don't really remember what it felt like because it was so long ago. And it's interesting, you know, I'm on that monthly pediatric laryngology division chief call and shout out to Mark Gerber who uh, set that up and, and kind of gets all the division chiefs together once a month on a Wednesday evening, just to have a quick Zoom call and a conversation. And it's interesting to hear how the different various laryngology divisions have handled this pandemic stuff. So for example, in Cincinnati, they were for a brief period of time doing a procedures clinic where anything that involved a known AGP like nasopharyngoscopy, they would bring those patients in separately so that they could clean the rooms in between procedures and have all the appropriate PPE and all that kind of stuff. You know, we never did that here. We sort of just developed our COVID protocols along the way. And I think like all of us on this podcast, and I'd love to hear how things were at Northwestern and UT Southwestern, but you know, we were kind of winging it along the way. And this gets back to what Jennifer was speaking about, about process development, right? So when we first realized that we had this new entity on our hands that was going to dramatically alter the way we could practice medicine, we had to figure out what are our pathways and protocols because no one had ever written them before. It's not like we could go back and say, well, let's pull up the pandemic protocols from 10 years ago and we'll revise them. We never had pandemic protocols, so we had to write them from scratch, right? So what we did was we said, okay, let's call the literature. Let's get everybody's experiences. And Jonathan mentioned in the chat box, the experiences from Stanford, where some of that first literature came out from the sinus world. And so we said, let's pull everybody's experience. You know, we got the experience from our colleagues in China. We got our experiences from our colleagues in Italy and said, what did they do that worked? And what did they recommend? Okay, how can we modify that for our institution? So for example, here at our institution, I developed one of the first things I developed was in April, we developed our COVID-19 tracheostomy protocol. How would we perform tracheostomy in the era of COVID-19? What were the appropriate steps? It's about a three, four page document. And it eventually was adopted by our health system. It was a kind of a best practice from engaged stakeholders. So it was our head of ICU, our head of general and trauma surgery, and then of course, uh, me from Odalair and so we said, let's put together a process improvement document that shows what's going to be our best practice around tracheostomy, what's going to be our best practices around AGPs, and created a document internally 
And then just a quick plug, you know, what we actually did on an international scale is we got everybody's protocols put together from 26 different countries and published that in the White Journal recently, which I think came out this month, looking at sort of a global experience of tracheostomy protocols and how it's being managed in various institutions and enterprises around the world. And that article was published in, I think, this month's uh, White Journal or last month's White Journal in a response uh, to some criticisms that we received is going out in next month's journal. But, you know, I think that all of us were in the same boat. We were faced with this blank canvas, right? A whole lot of uncertainty because, you know, there was a period of time where you were afraid to get anywhere near a COVID patient. You thought it was like Ebola or something where you were immediately going to get it and there was going to be a 90% fatality rate. And it was like a zombie apocalypse movie. None of us knew what we were dealing with. So we had this blank canvas and we painted it and then we realized half of it was wrong so we tore it up and started another canvas and we've kind of continually repainted it and I'd love to hear if everybody else's experiences have been similar in that way in that we're all just trying to figure out what the right thing was to do and it's taken us nine months but we're really honing down and refining our best practices along the way and those that's how we improve patient quality and quality care in the otolaryngology world in this in this uh, sort of unprecedented time. Yeah, I I think tearing up the canvas and having to redo it is okay. It's important. It's a good lesson. It's a skill. And that's how we grow. And like you said, with something so unknown and foreign and something that none of us have ever faced, that ability to have to change things and work through things is is an important skill. Yeah, you know, that that analogy, I, I actually think about it in a different analogy. I actually think about it almost like something that's been wrapped up in layers And it's almost like bit by bit, as we go on, we're figuring out which layers still need to be there and which layers don't. And we're slowly sort of peeling those back, hopefully more and more as we go. I mean, that's what quality improvement is. It's, it's, you know, cycles of change and you take, you know, you make a change, you look at it, you look at your data, you see what happened and then you tweak it. It's not just a one and done thing. And so, you know, our response to COVID, even though it's, you know, we had no playbook going into this, you know, we are using quality improvement methodology. Yeah, and Jennifer, you know, one thing I would say about that is it's not just quality improvement, right? What are we really doing? It's continuous quality improvement. We are continually, you know, when you look at the business world, they're talking about continuous performance improvement. And we don't, you're exactly right. It isn't a one and done. You don't just say, okay, here's the right thing to do and walk away from it. And not just in the COVID pandemic, right? Everything we're doing is continuously evolving. And I think it's important to constantly ask yourself, why did we do that? What decisions did we make? Why did we choose to do this? And continue the day that you actually accept that what you did was the right thing all the time is the day you should kind of hang it up because instead what we're trying to do is continually find new ways to improve on what we did before because every single day we're learning new things. And I think that that sort of continuous quality improvement concept rather than just the one and done like you mentioned. So I really think that's an important thing to remember. And I like the conversation. I think what frustrates me or what has frustrated me throughout this process is, you know, there have been different versions or different policies and procedures, and yet there's no conversation and or explanation or understanding. And I think that's important in the sense of personalizing it, contextualizing it, getting buy-in and understanding why we're doing what and why certain tweaks are needed. And I think that conversation is also part of, you know, policy improvement with your stakeholders. It's got to be, it can't just be, I think like Jennifer said it well, it can't just be top down. It's got to be at all levels, especially in healthcare, right? We have a healthcare problem. And yet sometimes you feel silenced. I'd also say that this whole experience has really rallied people around this sort of daily adaptation uh, mindset. And I find that in our institution, we are utilizing that heavily to sort of spearhead a mentality of, okay, now we've got people's attention about what we can do on the fly, make changes, make everybody safe, et cetera. What can we look at from before that we want to see in the future differently for our institution? How do we not just look at what we're doing for COVID in these few months, but what we've been doing in the past that we didn't think works well, because we've got lower volumes right now, we've got more time, we've got more space. How do we go forward then and set things up such that we can move forward the way we want to be. We could be the best institution that we think we can be in the future. We have the opportunity right now to make those that movement. People are sort of primed for that change management response. What do you guys think are some of the things that we can do better with respect to quality and safety, general as well as pediatric laryngology specifically? 
I'll, I'll start. That was a hard question, huh? <laughs> it is a tough question. You're absolutely <laughs> right. You know, what can we do? You know, I, I think the first thing, as some of the folks have already alluded to, is that it's uh, a big part of it is your perception and your attitude around it. If you choose to accept the status quo, you're never going to have improvement in your processes. And if you say, like Jonathan mentioned, hey, this is every day is an opportunity, you know, a COVID pandemic is in some ways an opportunity to say, okay, volumes are slower. Uh, we're not doing as much surgery. We're not doing any elective cases. I mean, our institution was shut down to elective cases for probably a month and a half, two months, something in that range. And I know you guys went through the same thing to say, okay, well, what are we going to do during that time? Let's look back at the things we've been doing and figure out how we can do them better. And sort of always paying attention to those things, engaged stakeholders are always going to use those as opportunities, not just crises, but as opportunities for improvement. And I, I think that's a big part of it to me. So for me, it's it, it comes down to it, one of the things I constantly think about is learning. And so how do you develop good habits? How do you learn good information? How do you obtain good information? And then how do you develop those habits so they stick? And uh, so we, you know, we constantly trying to look at our processes and do our best to standardize our processes. But even then, it can be challenging. You know, one of the things that happens a lot in the operating room is, I don't know, maybe you guys don't have this, but I'll get a resident and, you know, it'll be three weeks into the rotation, four weeks into the rotation. And, you know, like, okay, we did a supraglottoplasty. Patients getting admitted to the floor. They're going to have, they can have a regular diet. We're going to give them reflux medicine for four weeks just to be safe, blah, blah, blah. Same thing. But yet <laughs> the next day, hey, how often are you are you going to do, what are you going to do again? What's the standard approach? So th that's always been the challenge I find with quality and safety, it, it, creating standardized approaches, but also getting people to remember the standardized approaches. It, do you guys have those same challenges or is it is it just me? Yeah, I think those are definitely challenges. You know, I mean, when you were especially trying to standardize, I mean, we have a division of now 13 surgeons. And when you're trying to create a standard approach to try to minimize that unwarranted variation in the group, you know, everyone's initial reaction is, yeah, that sounds great. Let's create a standard algorithm, but I want to do it my way. And we'll make my way the standard. And, and people get very set in their practice and very set in the way that they do things. And not because there's any evidence that their way is better, but because that's the way that they're comfortable and used to. And Often I think wrong, people seem to never sometimes. In doubt. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so, you know, people need to, you know, so like with tonsillectomy at Lurie, we standardized practice um, across the division. And it actually took, you know, sitting people down in the room, we actually had a third party person facilitating it because then it was not well, a quality consultant facilitating it because then it wasn't like someone trying to pull their way over another. And they, what they did is they actually went through and asked every single person, you know, what's your age cutoff for opioids? What is, you know, do you do soft diet? Do you do this, do you do that? And then she put the all of the data in front of us and we realized that we were kind of roughly around the mean and we were able to kind of bring ourselves to the center and some people were like okay well then I can bring myself from point b to point a um, just fine and then after you agree to an algorithm one of the things that you have to do is you know you sometimes have to do things to hardwire said algorithm and make it easy to do and hard to deviate from. And so one of the things that we do is we utilize order sets that are pre-selected that actually put all of the information. So for example, we have an age cutoff for opioids and you can't even select it opioid, you have to enter it through a separate part of the orders in order to enter an opioid. So that forces people to actually have to work harder to deviate from the system. And that's like another way that we can, you know, achieve, you know, standardization when everyone likes their own way. So I just like the idea of you and Jim and Dana Thompson and Jonathan sitting around a table in a cage match, trying to sort yep. out, you know, how you guys are going to fight this out. That's a, that's a nice yep. picture in my head. I do want to, Jennifer, if I can tell a quick story, you know, we went through this and I presented this at ASPO a handful of years ago, and this is probably what I'll talk about when we do our thing uh, in January. We went through a thing when I first got here. So when I first got here to UT Houston from my first job, when I was recruited here, there was no pediatric otolaryngology program in place. And so we had to build one. And, you know, we've built one over the last decade that's been pretty successful. But part of what happened was over that decade, we uh, ended up taking on probably 95% of the tracheostomies, but we had some pediatric surgeons who wanted to do some of them. And what we ended up having was the situation where every pediatric laryngologist was handling post-op trach care in one way, 
And all the pediatric surgeons were doing things differently amongst themselves. So all of a sudden you had seven or eight different ways the trachs were being handled. And it led to a lot of problems. Honestly, we had a bunch of accidental decannulations. We had a bunch of post-op complications. So we finally said, all right, this is just a dumpster fire. We've got to do something about this. So we said, let's do exactly what you did, which is figure out what's the best way to handle this. And there was no way we were going to all sit around a table and negotiate this out. So instead, we said, let's go through the literature and figure out what people have established as a best practice. Okay, so we got the literature, we got these points out, and then we started creating a process document around that. And like you said, make it very hard to deviate from what's considered your accepted standard. So we created a process document. We obviously ran it through all the affected stakeholders 30 different times. It took a year to finally get it tuned down. And then once we did it, we were able to create a document for the ICUs that says, here is your pathway for post-op tracheostomy. Here is how we're going to manage post-op trachs. Here's what you can expect in terms of soft collars versus ties, stay sutures versus, you know, all the different things that people are doing. And here's what day you can expect a trach change. And so we created this process document and now that's posted and in front of every fresh tracheostomy. And, you know, otolaryngology performs 93, 94% of the trachs at this institution. So it was pretty easy for the four of us to kind of get together and say, what are we going to do? But even amongst the four of us, we've had some discrepancies. So, you know, when we came, came up with that document, we were able to finally get consensus as an institution and as an enterprise. So that's now a system-wide accepted process for post-op pediatric tracheostomy. But even then, in, within my division, we have some people who do very early tracheostomy change, so as early as day three, and then some who do it a little bit more of the standard day five to seven. And we said, okay, well, why are we doing this two different ways? But we didn't know what the right way was to do it. So what did we do? We studied it, and we went back and looked at 10 years worth of data for early trach change versus late trach change. And I'm pleased to tell you, we just submitted the revised manuscript to, I think, Laryngoscope or White Journal or something, but this was presented at ASPO last year, because we had to find a way to come to consensus, and the only way to do that was to actually look at our data and our institutional data. So, I, I mean, I think you nailed it. You've got to just kind of look at what you're doing, get everybody together and say, what really is the evidence base behind what we're doing? And so, you know, on that completely tangential note, as I think, as uh, Gopi mentioned early on, I'm taking over as chair of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Committee starting this fall. And in that transition, one of the things I'm very interested in doing is partnering with a number of other AAO and ASPO committees. So in particular, evidence-based medicine, because how can we talk about quality care if we're not using evidence basis for making our decisions? Those two things, in my opinion, go hand in hand. Similarly, for ASPO this year, we're talking a lot about uh, equity and equitable healthcare delivery because you cannot have quality care if if your care is not being delivered equitably. After all, equitable distribution of care is considered one of the six tenets of quality care by the IOM. So, you know, all of these things kind of play into how we can get our institutions and our enterprises to, to get things in a consistent manner, which improves outcomes for everybody. And then, you know, we looked at our outcome data after we came up with these process documents for tracheostomy and our unplanned accidental decannulations, all of our post-op complications dropped by like 80% over the next year. So, you know, these things do, do have an impact. Sorry for the lengthy diatribe. No. Yeah, no, and one of the things I think also what we can be doing nationally as an academy is really kind of honing in on, you know, our participation in registries. I know we have Regent, there's NISQIP, the GTC, all of that stuff. That's how you're going to get the data because especially when events are rare, you're never going to get it from a single institution. And so, you know, nationally, that could probably be one of the biggest ways that we can get our evidence in order to improve quality. Yeah, and Regent and NISQIP are huge for this. I would say also that one of the, if you if you step back and look at the American healthcare system and the history of the American healthcare system, there are significant factors working against everything we try and do for quality and safety. People's reimbursement, their compensation is not aligned with quality and safety initiatives. So uh, that's a really, really important place to start because a, a lot of times, I mean, if you want, if you want the masses to follow what's best for the patient and family, you have to make it not contrary to their own self-interest. That's an excellent point. I, I like the fact that you brought it back to equity and justice. You know, we, we talk about that um, quite a bit in some of the other organizations I belong to. We recently talked about uh, disparities. We had a whole conference on sort of how do you promote diversity in pediatric laryngology. In fact, we're going to have a panel at the, the winter meeting. And so that comes up quite a bit. How do you look at diversity? And one of the concepts that came up was 
we, we tend to look at equity as, well, we got to make sure the right kind of people are in place or the, the right kind that, in effect, people get the right procedures. But they, they kind of flipped it on his head and said, you, know, you should be thinking about justice, like promoting justice. So if, you, if you're interested in sort of having a diverse uh, community of providers, it, it means that you have to start looking beyond to what your expectations are in terms of the right kind of woman, the right kind of African American, the right kind of Indian American, whatever you have, you have to go beyond that and say, we have to ex- look at justice. So a couple other questions. I think we're, this has been a really great conversation. And obviously we, we don't want to keep you guys all day. I really appreciate you taking time out to talk to us, but I wanted to ask just a few more questions. One of them, I wanted to get back to COVID a little bit. Do you think our practices are going to go back to what they were before, particularly for AGPs. Like, I'm curious, are you guys going to continue to wear N95s? Are you going to continue to sort of have that level? I remember we used to do flexible scopes in the clinic. Sometimes you wouldn't wear gloves. And I'm just, now I wear gloves, I wear N95, I wear eye protection. I'm curious if, even if the COVID pandemic starts to settle out, are you going to continue certain practices regardless? Well, uh, Jonathan and I actually have failed our fit testing. And so we both have to wear peppers, which is fine, but it definitely does. It, it, it limits your ability to interact well with the patient because you've got this fan blowing in your ear. It's hard to hear. I feel like I'm yelling. And so I do have to balance like, you know, my own personal safety and well-being with being able to, you know, really be able to care for my patients. And so, you know, obviously in the COVID era, that's that's one thing, you know, where I have to, you know, make sure that everyone's protected because of COVID. But once that is over, I'm I'm not sure if I would continue using a PAPR, you know, for for me, but you know, I guess I don't want to speak for Jonathan. I mean, our our institution for our otolaryngology clinics has done a pretty good job of facilitating what we need to keep things moving. Obviously, volumes are not like they were, you know, a year ago, not just because of demand, but also because of crowded waiting rooms, crowding elevators, crowding clinics, EGPs, etc. My focus wherever I have been uh, doing my clinics has been to try and identify workflows that allow me to continue to use these methods, as long as we're going to need them and continue to keep things moving. So we've been identifying conference rooms for post AGP conversations, and we've been identifying other spaces that we can utilize uh, using multiple spaces for AGPs with HEPA filters to clear them out. So, So rather than trying to figure out whether I'm going to do the procedure or not, it's more about what are some more innovative ways. Again, it's sort of what Dr. Roy was talking about, challenging what you're doing now to see if there's a way to do it better every single day. Yeah, for me, it gets back to, to some degree, this kind of blank canvas concept, because Romain, you're asking about things, what's it going to be like in the future? I mean, if you'd asked me this question a year ago, there is no way I would have told you I was going to be dressed up like a NASA astronaut just to get a trach done, right? And so, you know, a year from now, if the pandemic is completely gone, do I anticipate wearing a full spacesuit every time I want to scope a kid in clinic? No, I, I really hope that's not the case. But, you know, certainly we're going to have to adapt to changes along the way. I think in this era of immunization and vaccination now, we don't know what it's going to look like because, you know, at the same time that we're finally starting to get vaccinated, and I think almost all of us on this podcast have either been vaccinated for our first round or are going to be vaccinated within the next uh, week or so. Um, So a month from now, we'll all be theoretically fully vaccinated, and yet the number of cases in the U.S. are skyrocketing. So, you know, we have these kind of two disparate things going in opposite directions. What's that going to turn to by next March or by next June? And, you know, this is coupled with the fact that, yeah, volumes are down because patients are in many ways trying to avoid elective care. And as Jonathan alluded to, one of the things that's happened in the pediatric otolaryngology world is we've seen a decline in sort of our bread and butter illnesses. I think just about everybody would agree that recurrent acute otitis media has basically gone away. And it turns out that the cure for otitis media was in front of us all the time. Talk about finding out new things every day. All we have to do is wrap children in a bubble and lock them away from one another and they never get otitis media. It's a miracle. So, you know, we're learning these new things. We don't really know what's going to happen. We're going to have to adapt to those changes as we go forward. I will say that for me, and this is just on a personal note, the most painful part for my day-to-day job now is the fact that I can't hug the kids that I see and I can't hug the parents because as you guys all know, we do develop long-term relationships with some of these kids. 
Um, yeah, I mean, we have our kids who get their tonsils out and we shake hands and we probably never see them again. But we also have a huge proportion of children who we know from the time they're born until the time we all retire, keel over and die at our jobs. But one way or the other, they're with us for life. And you, you know, you get invited to those kids' school parties and to their graduations and you get Christmas cards. And, you know, part of that relationship is the parents hug you every time they see you, like your long-term trach patients and things like that, your LTR patients and the, the chronic airway problems. And the kids hug you. And I miss that. I genuinely miss just being able to have that relationship. And as Jennifer alluded to, it's hard to have that relationship when you're in a PAPR or an N95 and you're in full uh, protective gear. I want some of that back. And that's just me being personal. I miss this. I was having a conversation with Paul Wilgang from Cincinnati not too long ago. Um, and this was kind of in the height of the pandemic. And he said, you know, kind of the hardest part of this is the parts of the, the job that bring you the most joy were in many ways uh, taken away from us. They put barriers up because it's not just PPE. Those are barriers to the things that bring you joy in your day-to-day -day practice. And so I want some of those things to change. Yeah. I mean, just having, being able to have conferences and be able to sit around and lunch and chat with your colleagues about cases uh, has become more constrained. So we're going to start to wind things down a little bit. Uh, I want to pick your brains about one case since I have all these airway experts on the line. And I guess we could talk about quality and safety as well and how you get consensus. So I was re re recently presented a case of a, a young adult. He's probably about 20 years old. He was involved with the fire and a significant burns over his body had to be intubated. And post-extubation, he developed long segment tracheal stenosis. And pretty much the entire trachea has got stenosis involved, probably just the cricoid and a one centimeter above the carina is not stenosed. And so there's been a lot of debate, well, what should we do with this particular patient? And so I'm curious if you were presented with that, again, long segment stenosis from an intubation after a burn, you know, I told them I think slide tracheoplasty is a pretty good option for this young man, but other people are like, no, 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 just put a trach in and just see what happens. Others are like, no, we got to do a complex T tube, uh, Y stent. And so I'm curious, you know, thinking about quality and safety, obviously safety for this particular patient as well as the quality of his life and best practices, but also there's a lot of disagreement between experts. How would you go about this particular case and how would you go about presenting your side of the story or what you think is the best option for the patient? Well, I'll go ahead and start <laughs> this one. I mean, given at face value, a long segment tracheal stenosis is everything, you know, the entire trachea except uh, a centimeter at the top and bottom, then I would agree with you on face value. Absolutely. A slight tracheoplasty is really the way to go. It doesn't sacrifice, it doesn't burn any bridges. You know, if you need to go and do resections later, you still have that opportunity to some degree. In listening to some of the other options that you presented, I'm not really sure how a tracheostomy works. I mean, obviously, depending on on how how stenosed the patient is, and you know what 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 do you what do you put around? What are you putting in around that T tube to make that long segment tracheal stenosis better, right? So uh, I feel like in a lot of ways, either a resection or a slide are the only things that really address your problem. And within that, one of those doesn't burn bridges and um, provides a more, um, shall we say, physiologic trachea to the patient. Is the stenosis pretty mature at this point or is it still developing? It's still fairly active, but the patient needs something. Because mm -hmm. the reason I ask that is because actually Jonathan and I are collaborating on a patient who has a not quite as long, but probably a four or five centimeter stenosis, but it's full of granulation tissue. And so we can't slide, you know, a patient like that. We're going to have to resect it. But fortunately, it's only it's, it's probably about, you know, four centimeter or so of the trachea. And so that we can do a resection. You know, Romaine, you, you bring up I think what is a, a key point here, which is that you don't really know what the long term is here, especially if it's still active. And when it's still active, it's real hard to commit to something like, I don't think I would want to slide somebody who still has a super active trachea if it's still really inflamed and still maturing, but you need to do something. There are sort of conservative interim measures that you can consider like balloon dilation, uh, steroid injection to kind of temporize it until this thing matures and then go ahead and slide. And I, you know, I agree with what everybody else said here that I think slide is going to be a better option in the long run, but you don't want to do it in an active trachea. And 
increase the likelihood of failure. But I think what you said actually kind of gets to the heart of the issue, which is there's not an expert consensus on this, right? There's nobody who's done a thousand slide tracheoplasties in active tracheas after burn intubation injury. And so, you know, there isn't a huge database to say, well, what does all the evidence point to? And, you know, we talk a lot about using evidence-based medicine in determining quality care. Unfortunately, there are just things where we don't have large evidence bases. And so we have to go off of our best scientific instinct, off of experience, off of the experience of others. And what we have, and, you know, I, I think I can speak for all of us in this podcast to say that none of us really feel like we work alone. And we reach out to one another constantly. You know, I was talking to, to Jennifer and Jonathan's partner just two days ago about a case. Dana Thompson, and I had called her about a case for advice. And, you know, we all talk to each other constantly to say, hey, I got this situation. There's not a great evidence base that says, here's the right answer. What do you think I should do? And we kind of figure it out along the way. And I think that's part of quality care is collaborating with people who may have a little bit of experience and then using experiential learning in that process to improve the quality of care that we deliver. Yeah, if we want to talk about quality in the airway, I think we should probably bring up that great work that Karthik and Doug did a couple of years ago with that Delphi project yeah. uh, on airway outcomes. That is really the way that we need to be going. It seems like that might have stalled to some degree. I know that Karthik changed locations and, and, and he was really powering a lot behind it. But that idea of getting the entire airway community internationally on board into a unified discussion about what are we trying to get out of these procedures? What are the right ways to get there? And what should be the outcomes that we're looking for? That's really the way that we need to go in airway surgery. Because when 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 I have people who are not, you know, that don't really know much about aerodigestive, they'll come to me and they say, you know, I was looking for some aerodigestive literature, I can't really find anything. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's because it's not really there. Well, Jonathan, I mean, I think, you know, that's where things like IPOG and the consensus statements come together, because if you don't have a huge scientific evidence base, what do you have? You have a, a bunch of people around the world who have a little bit of expertise each in some of these complex but very nuanced areas. So get everybody together. So, you know, for example, the uh, paper that Gopi made reference to when she introduced you, the IPOG on exit and anticipated prenatal airway obstruction papers, which you and I were both authors on, I actually shared that with our fetal team not too long ago after it first came out and said, look, here's the pediatric otolaryngology consensus statement, expert consensus statement. And I think those kinds of consensus statements are incredibly useful in situations where you don't have just necessarily a large scientific base to work off of. Let me, let me also give a plug for, you know, I'm one of the associate editors for the White Journal, and oftentimes I'll get articles and the quality is not as good, but if you're interested in improving the quality of the literature, take those statements, and usually there are knowledge gaps within those statements. Start writing papers about those knowledge gaps and use that knowledge gap as a scientific rationale. You know, I'll, I'll do everything I can to get those papers through because that's what's needed. Even things like the, the consensus statements that come out of the White Journal and tonsillectomy, there's like 35 different research needs just write, thinking about writing about those research needs can make a huge, uh, a huge difference in, in what's out there in the literature. I'm going to wind it down. I'll ask each of the guests to say any last words. We'll start with Dr. Ida. So I wanted to just say a couple of things. My, my background is not like Dr. Laven and Dr. Roy. I actually am fairly new to the quality and safety world, but I have more of a process improvement business background. And I have learned over that time that those within healthcare need to be completely integrated. And that's why I have benefited so much from having Dr. Laven as a partner, because she's helped me with so many of those things. While I'm doing some of the operations work, she's helping me with the quality and safety work. And one of the one of the points that Dr. Roy alluded to early on in this in this hour was about building that burning platform. How do you convince people that a change is needed. And that's one of the most important skills as anyone on this on this group can probably attest to. That's one of the most important skills because if you don't get the right people behind you and understanding what the problem is and how it really impacts your institution, your patients, your division, your department, et cetera, um, then you really won't get anywhere. And, and I think that that's one of the most powerful moments within the development of these projects. 
Dr. Roy, any last words? A couple things. First of all, Romaine, I didn't realize you were the associate editor of the White Journal now. So first, congratulations. And second of all, would you do me a favor and give our early tracheostomy change paper a quick look on that second review? Because we'd love to get that accepted and fill in that knowledge gap. I'm going to just uh, try, not, to, try to I'm leverage. I'm not the editor for that Darn particular it. paper. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, you know, uh, kind of echoing what our, what our panelists have all uh, mentioned here, you know, quality and safety is not an individualized effort. It is absolutely the definition of a collaborative enterprise. And that means that you've got to collaborate not only with your co-physicians, your colleagues, your partners, but with people in other aspects of the healthcare enterprise in which you work and other people on a national and international scale. I'm saying that predominantly as a plug for the AAO PSQI committee, which I'll be chairing next year. You know, I'm going to rely very heavily on otolaryngologists who are engaged and interested in the quality and safety process. You don't have to be a quality geek. You don't have to have studied all the methodology. If you just have an interest and quality and safety, come and partner with us because everybody has something valuable to share. And I could really use the help. And the more engagement we have from otolaryngologists around the country in both the pediatric and adult arenas, the better we're going to become as an organization in terms of the AAO, the better we're all going to become as otolaryngologists and the better quality care we can deliver through our individual practices. So everybody who's listening to this is probably doing so because they're somewhat interested in the quality and safety world. Use that interest. Come and join with us in the AAOP SQI. And even if you don't want to join the committee or don't have the time commitment, just shoot me an email, shoot me a text, say, hey, I have an idea. Hey, I have a knowledge gap or hey, I want to come up with something because we, we need that kind of engagement to really continue to move forward. This is a group effort involving all the otolaryngologists around the world to make this better. Thank you. Dr. Laven. Yes, I, I just wanted to tack a, a little bit on to what um, Dr. Ida was saying. You know, whenever you, there's always every day you see quality improvement opportunities and possibilities in your work unit. And, but as Dr. Ida said, you're going to gain the most traction if you do create that burning platform. And one of the things that positions you well for success is you really need to have a deep understanding of your organization's, you know, fiscal year goals, what the 10 year goals are the organization. And when you have, when you come across a problem, try to think of a way to be able to tie it to those organizational goals, because that's again, how you can leverage uh, resources, you know, from the executive sponsorship level. Thank you so much. And just to conclude, thank you all for joining us. Again, I think all of us are members of the various organizations, quality and safety committees. You know, Dr. Roy is chair of the American Academies Committee. I'm chair of the ASPO Committee. Dr. Ida also joins me on the ABEA's Community Outreach Committee. And we will be giving another talk, a more formal talk in January, I believe it's January 14th, uh, hour-long seminar sponsored by ABEA and ASPO on quality and safety. We'll be doing a lot of the, going in more detail on some of the things we talked about this, this today. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I will give it back to you to close us out. Yeah, I just want to say thank you guys so much for your time this morning. Dr. Johnson, you're an awesome moderator. I've learned so much from the panel today. Jennifer, the challenge of foundational assumption. It's, I love it. Dr. Roy, I'm about to start repainting my canvas and redoing it constantly. And Dr. Ida, I like the getting everybody on the wagon together um, because as a group, we have a voice and it can make a difference. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in. You can find us at, on Twitter at underscore Backtable ENT. Our podcasts are on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple, and iTunes. And I guess this is a wrap. Thanks for joining.